So, so as I was saying while I was muted is yes, <laughs> the first, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, we allow folks to enter. So as participants are rolling in, we're just, you know, staring oh. at our screen <laughs> because of Zoom. <laughs> If you are entering the Zoom webinar and settling in, you're welcome to use the chat feature. Uh, I think it default sets to a private, like to host and panelists. So if you want to engage with everyone, change your to field to everyone and say hello and welcome. I'll give another moment for attendees to trickle in. And then we'll get started. All right. Good evening. And welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight, and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Sarah Fawn Montgomery presenting her new book, Halfway From Home. She'll be talking with James Tate, JT Hill, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Sarah, James, and the team at Split Lip press for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now just a couple of quick housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation to the author and to interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question that you'd like to have answered by either of our panelists, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Halfway From Home, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off the featured book. Enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon code discount section at checkout online for 10% off. Our interviewer tonight is James Tate Hill. James is the author of a memoir, Blind Man's Bluff. His fiction debut, Academy Gothic, won the Nielsen Literary Prize for a first novel. He serves as fiction editor for Monkey Bicycle and contributing editor for Literary Hub, where he writes a monthly audiobook column. He will be speaking with our featured author, Sarah Fawn Montgomery. Sarah Fawn is the author of Quite Mad, an American Pharma memoir, and three poetry chapbooks. She is an assistant professor at Bridgewater State University. When she left a chaotic home at 18, Author Sarah Fawn Montgomery chased restlessness, claiming places on the West Coast, Midwest, and East Coast, while determined never to settle. Now her family is ravaged by addiction, illness, and poverty. The country is increasingly divided, and the natural worlds in which she seeks solace are under siege by wildfires, tornadoes, and unrelenting storms. In her new book, Halfway From Home, Montgomery turns to nostalgia as a way to grieve a rapidly changing world, excavating the stories and scars we bury and unearthing literal and metaphorical childhood time capsules and treasures. Sarah Fawn is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she'll be talking with James and with all of you. So please take it away, Sarah. 
Thank you very much, Kay, and thanks to everybody who turned out tonight. I'm really excited to um, kick off my tour for Halfway From Home. This is the first event, um, and I'm thrilled to be sharing virtual space with Greenlight and with JT, who's an author I really respect and admire, and I'm just excited to talk to tonight. Um, I'm going to start with a short reading. This is from a essay in the collection that's called In Search of Nostalgia. In the shaded grove, temperatures swell to 70. Warm enough that in winter we peel layers from our bodies like the bright bellied lizards darting like shadows beneath our feet. We crouch bleak branches, make walking sticks of the broken bits, leave our soft prints on the moss laden path. We don't need to go far to find no one. Solitude and space are easy to come by in our one stoplight town where most roads are dirt. Drive a mile in any direction from our high school and the rolling hills embrace you. Valley Oak and Interior Live Oak compete for space with the gray pine and manzanita. Their towering branches are the only skyscrapers we rural kids have ever known. We know nothing of cities and nature's scarcity because all the roads in and out of town lead to the beach. And in summer, we pluck poppies, clutch sunshine in our hands. This is why we do not fear poison oaks linking up the trees of our Eden, though it lives, leaves more than one of us welted and red, pus sticky and miserable. It is easy to forget the fear of what might be when hummingbird sage blooms pink, when blue lupin and yellow mustard dot the hills, when we go to the beach to line our pockets with sand dollars. Each day after school, we pile into one another's cars and drive a mile or so until the road looks just right. We park and leave the doors unlocked because around here, most everyone has what they need or want, and we walk into a field over a fence slung low like our jeans. Yes, we kick at the dandelions, but that is only because we are wishing for college or a tank full of gas to drive out to the beach dunes, where we love how the earth gives way beneath us because we aren't afraid yet to fall. We find a spot and sit in a circle under the trees, counting down till the last time we'll be like this. We gather every day after school to play a card game called magic. And maybe it's the way the creek sounds like laughing, which makes us feel like crying. Or maybe it's because the sun has always made us feel like we can't sit still, like if we don't move, we'll burst. Or maybe it's because everything hurts so good at this age, in this place, and we want to linger a little longer. Graduation is coming. Soon we'll scatter, moving to places where we can't park, or at least not for free where we won't be able to look up and see moss drip from the trees, where we won't be able to drive out to the eucalyptus grove in winter and see 10,000 monarchs nestling for warmth, the whole forest rustling and alive. We'll spread out from the coastal heart of California to bigger places like San Francisco or Los Angeles or Fresno, which we know isn't glamorous, but has multiple stoplights illuminating the loneliness we'll discover. For now, we sit in the woods, imagining worlds, making magic. We survived Y2K and are trying to understand what the television says about weapons of mass destruction in a war we don't want, but also don't understand. Like when the guy who lost the presidential election says the climate is changing, even though here it never seems to, all golden warmth stretched out forever. Graduation looms and with it the realities beyond our tiny town, but no one talks about that. Instead, we cling together in plain sight, storytelling between shadows, and sunlight. Even since I was a child, I felt a sweet ache at my core, the kind of satisfaction that left me swooning, and more at the same time, I could not fathom being more fulfilled. I felt it while driving with my father in his beat up pickup truck, the two of us bouncing on the stiff seats out to the dump. Every road is a back road when we live in the middle of nowhere. And each time we approached a dip, my father pressed his foot to the pedal and down we went, slipping into the dust, my tummy somersaulting with the delightful and confusing fear. The feeling was the same when I went camping with my parents and the trees looked familiar and foreign, making me believe I'd been there a thousand times before, but also wondering if I was misremembering. Sometimes I'd see a tree in a different park or at my elementary school, and my tummy would drop with remembering, and I'd be happy and sad all at once. One feeling was green, and another one was blue, and they swirled together until I wasn't sure exactly how I felt. When I was happy, I was also sad, because every good thing had to end. The smell of applesauce made me miss my grandmother, even when she was in the other room, because she was aging in front of me, 
and the nestle quick she stirred up for me in tiny blue glasses was so sweet that it started to sing often the surge would accompany memories of home the smell of sawdust taking me back to my father's workshop an empty pasture stretching seemingly forever or the sun hitting the road wide as an old song came on the radio when i moved away to start my life somewhere else convinced like many millennials that this fresh start would mean success I missed home all the time. When I moved from California to Nebraska for graduate school, the sweet ache rarely came. Less often still when years later, I moved to Massachusetts to begin a job. I was so busy making my way in the world that I did not realize how quickly it had changed. By the time I stopped to notice, America was no longer the home nation should I known, but instead a danger I could not fathom. A new climate and political control meant the country was now constantly on guard our nation pulsing its many grievances. Everywhere was a throbbing hurt, and I missed the homeland of my youth like I missed my actual home, neither of which existed anymore. Thank you. Thank you for, for that, Sarah Fawn. I'm so excited to be here with you, and I'm glad you read those pages from that essay because that was one of my favorites and and it's it's really such a wonderful collection and I hope everybody uh, checks it out in full but we're going to talk about some of the topics and and some of the terrain you cover literal and, and figurative um, but you touch on home there and how home changes and you touch on how in the book, there's there's this wonderful um, line of thinking and this this wonderful line where home only feels like a comfort when you know it's temporary, and the the malleability of home and and how home is constantly changing uh, in that piece is not really something you can control, but throughout the book we we come to to know you as not a nomad, not a wanderer, but but someone um, who moves a lot uh, and is is almost um, um, more at home while you're moving. And I wondered if you could just talk about the tension. Um, and the title of the collection is so brilliant, Halfway From Home, because we don't know whether you're halfway from home because you've left or halfway because you're returning to home. So it's that liminal space between returning and leaving um, that colors so much of the collection uh, in this really unique and beautiful way. But that's a, a very long way of saying, can you talk about how you came to have such a complicated relationship to home? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for all those kind words you said. I, I so appreciate that you spent time with, with my book and with my yeah. story. Um, for me, home has always been a very complicated space. It's always been a space that um, is sort of constantly in flux. Um, I thought of home as something that existed because it was going to be changing very quickly or because it wasn't going to last. Um, part of that comes from my own sort of home of origin and, and the way I was raised. I come from a very sort of non-traditional family. There's eight kids in my family. Uh, the oldest is in his 50s, the youngest is 15. Um, everyone's from different biological families. Um, five of my siblings are adopted. And so when I was growing up, every few years, um, my parents would adopt another child or a set of children from a, a different biological family. So every few years, the family structure changed um, pretty dramatically. Um, and in addition to that, we also had a lot of um, foster children, a lot of um, children and adults and, and even entire families uh, that were experiencing um, housing insecurity that would stay with us for long periods of time. Um, so you never knew who was coming or going and, and people would, they would arrive and then they would leave very, very quickly. Um, and part of home for me was also sort of the literal and, and, and sort of um, the, you know, the physical home. So my father worked in construction and every time we had a new body added to the house, he would build a new room. And so he was yeah. constantly building rooms inside of rooms. And so even though we were getting more rooms and more bodies, um, the walls were almost sort of closing in on you and, and a, a wall would appear where there didn't used to be one before. So the house yeah. was a maze. Um, so that sense of home of, of people coming and going very quickly sort of shaped my childhood. And then as somebody who is a first generation student who pursued education and now works in academia, 
I moved a lot for school. So I moved about an hour or so away for undergrad, then a few hours away from home for my master's degree, um, from California to Nebraska for a PhD, and then from Nebraska to Massachusetts for a job as a professor. And so all of those homes were places that I I knew I wasn't going to be for very long. They were always temporary, which is why I love them so much. Um, I think we we ignore our homes or we we ignore our landscapes when we're used to them or when we expect them to stand for forever. But because I always knew they were temporary, I was I was noticing and I was looking so much more and I was um, being mindful and paying attention. And I was able to fall in love with them because I knew I was was going to leave. And so that sense of leaving has defined home for me in a lot of ways. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And and like you said, going all the way back to childhood where the people in your home are always changing and the shape of the, the literal home is, is always changing. Um, that's the perfect transition to, to my next question. Uh, you write really, really um, beautifully is not the right word, though it applies, but you write with so much nuance about the recent and and by most accounts still ongoing uh pandemic and how many of us uh were affected by that in so many different ways but in in terms of the the ways it intersects with how we define home um i was impressed by how you touched on that and the place that we think of as the the most stable um, in our lives where we live was inevitably changed by by the pandemic through the isolation or the ways we we change our relationship to the outdoors. I I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about um, how you knew you were going to write about that topic, which is so recent, um, and did it feel while it was happening that you were that your home your your sense of home was was changing yeah for me a lot of the the essays were things that I was experiencing and thinking about a lot of the sort of isolation or or loneliness or sense of um fracturing that was happening in the nation and certainly in terms of climate change were things I've been thinking about for several years I would say probably post 2016 presidential election is when a lot of us started to feel this sense of disconnection um, and sort of isolation. Um, it was the pandemic though, it was the, the time, right? The time and the, and the solitude to be able to process that. I think before that I was doing a lot of ignoring, I was, I was working, I was, um, I was keeping busy as we all do. And then when the pandemic hit and I was, I was trapped at home, like so many of us were, um, I was able to start thinking about wanting to write about nostalgia and collective grief. Um, and I also um, was very fortunate enough, very, very privileged enough to be um, living in my first home right when the pandemic hit. I, I purchased my first home and moved in in January of 2020. Um, it was my first time buying a home. I, I was very hesitant to do so because I like to move so much. Um, my partner really encouraged us to um, put down some roots. Um, and it's in a very rural area, a very isolated area. Um, and so I was outside a lot, walking around a lot, getting to know my area and my home, um, while also feeling very, very trapped and very isolated because I'm someone who enjoyed traveling and moving so yeah. much. And was someone who found a lot of freedom in being able to escape or to leave. Um, so it was an interesting time, but I do think that it provided me the space and the opportunity to process a lot of the, the essays and the topics that I was thinking through. Yeah, yeah, and you know, the essay doesn't often lend itself to something so contemporary or something so recent, but uh, I was almost grateful for the amount of, of distance that these essays seem to have, even though I know, wow, this is just a couple of years ago, but your lyrical uh, prose and, and the lyric essays uh, sort of enclose everything behind a, a beautiful uh, amber glass that gave me, you know, distance in ways that I haven't yet uh, been able to to maintain or been able to, to achieve with the pandemic. Um, and along those same or similar lines, I think the pandemic is a good transition to the, the topic of disability um, because it, it really 
claimed so many uh, disabled um, people. And we started seeing just, well, some, some people started seeing for the first time uh, just how, how thoroughly um, ignored uh, that entire segment of the population is. And you and I both identify as disabled. And I wondered, not so much with the pandemic, but if you could just talk, um, that, was, that was how we met, was through the brevity um, special topic uh, disability issue. And um, you're one of the most fabulous people in the literary community uh, who looks out for accessibility and your entire book tour is, is accessible. And I, I just wanna say thank you and that matters. Um, but just to talk about how your disability or your relationship to disability uh, informs your writing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm somebody as a disabled writer that um, I'm, I'm a neurodivergent writer. I'm also a writer with chronic illness and chronic pain. So disability informs every aspect of my writing. Um, I tend to to produce my work to write um, in moments of, of extreme pain. Um, so to sit at a desk is to be in pain, to sit in front of a screen is to, to be in pain, to find the time to write. Um, you know, usually as writers, we're writing at the end of the day, we're writing on the weekends, and those are times that are usually reserved for, for rest and, and for recovery. So when I'm writing, I'm, I'm writing amidst pain, because of pain, through pain, um, you know, pain is always sort of present. Um, and I think pain shows up in a lot of the work that I do, um, it certainly showed up in Quite Mad, which is my memoir about mental illness. Um, but I, pain and disability run all throughout Halfway From Home. I, I write about mental health and neurodivergency. I write about um, scars and trauma um, and, and pain sort of carried in the body and kind of written on the bone. Um, I also write a lot about um, addiction in my family um, and thinking of, of, of pain and chronic illness in a lot of different ways. Um, so it shapes sort of the literal writing um, because I have to find new ways to write and, and new ways to be able to kind of um, produce the work. Um, but I would say it also really shapes the craft um, because of how I have to learn to write. So for me as a writer, when I'm writing, um, I'm writing in small segments. Um, I might only be able to write a couple of sentences or a couple of paragraphs. Um, I have to write in short bursts. I can't write for for long stretches of time. And so as a result, I tend to write in segments. And so the majority of the essays in Halfway Home, Halfway From Home are segmented essays. And each segment was written in a moment where I could escape pain or, or, or where I could just write for a, few, for a few moments before I needed to get up and move my body and, and tend to myself. Um, so the, the format, you know, the form and structure of these are very much influenced by pain. Um, I would say the essays too, being, you know, being in the pandemic, I was in more pains. I didn't have access to a lot of my specialists that I normally see yeah. um, and that take care of my, my body and, and my mind. Um, and so because I was not feeling my best in the pandemic, like a lot of us weren't, um, it affects the structure in, in other ways too. So I was um, I was writing you know, much smaller sections. My attention was fragmented, like a lot of our attention was. And so the sections are more fragmented and more lyrical. Um, but I, I think of disability writing and, and writing you know, through and with and because of pain um, as, as sort of an asset. Um, it's, it's a challenge, of course, but um, that lens that I use, I think lends itself quite well to the work that I'm trying to do. Um, and to be able to write in pain or because of pain or through pain allows you to, to focus on very different things and see the world very differently. Um, for me, it inspires a lot of gratitude, uh, which I hope resonates throughout the work. I'm able to, to be grateful for a lot of things. I'm very grateful for a, a pain-free day or a light pain day. I'm yeah. grateful for a, a chance to go outside on a walk um, and to escape uh, to escape pain even, even momentarily. Um, so I, I think that that's how it has shaped this collection and how it continues to shape my work. Yeah, that, that resonates with, I was on a, a panel last May with uh, the poet Kay Ulandai Barrett. And I don't know if you know their work, but um, Kay was talking about uh, with their disability, how some days you're just spooning the words, you know, and, and creating work through spoonfuls. And that definitely uh, is what I'm hearing a little bit from you is is the shape of the work um the shape of the work is is determined by the 
ability, the, the, the endurance. Um, that said, I, I do think that Halfway From Home still has a very sweeping and extremely cohesive feel. It's, it's very much, a, um, I don't know, we can, we can get into the debate of, is it a memoir and essays? Is it an essay collection? I mean, it, it has the cohesiveness it, that if you're looking for a memoir and essays or a, a memoir, I think you'll find that cohesiveness uh, of theme. But um, what, let's, let's go ahead and dive into nostalgia, which is one of my own personal obsessions. And it is, um, it stripes the book in really lovely, complicated ways. Um, and, and you talk about how nostalgia is, um, oh gosh, I, I, I can't remember the exact line, but as I'm, I'm obsessed with the 1980s um, and now moving into some 1990s obsession as I get fur further away from that. And I, I wonder sometimes to what extent nostalgia is keeping me out of the moment, to what extent it is um, perhaps unproductive. Uh, and I wonder if you can, you can talk about that, um, you know, to what extent is, is nostalgia um, a salve? And, and is it maybe, are there times where nostalgia can be um, sort of a, a, a spiral or a pit? Yeah, so for me, my my obsession with nostalgia or my history with nostalgia goes um, back a long ways. I can remember being a child and feeling nostalgic for something that was still happening. I, I have memories of really yeah. four or five of it being Christmas and being like, oh, it will be over soon. I better stop and, and preserve this in my memory. I better make a memory because it will be gone, um, you know, tomorrow it'll be over. Um, and so that sense of trying to preserve things or catalog things in my mind um, to, to remember them is something that I've carried with me. Um, in terms of nostalgia, I always think of nostalgia as, as, you know, there's two sides to the coin. I think we often think of nostalgia as sort of a rosy sweetness. It's, it's often accused of being quite sentimental. Yeah, yeah. Um, but nostalgia, you know, at, at its origins, you know, it was originally theorized as um, a mental illness, right? And it was theorized as a, as a homesickness illness that afflicted um, soldiers. And it was something that you didn't want to have because it was thought that it could cause, um, you know, internal organ damage and brain damage and, and hallucinations and paranoias and deaths. So it was not seen as something um, positive for, for many, many years. Um, and that's the way that I think of nostalgia. I mean, it certainly has its rosy moments when we're thinking of, of you know, 90s fashion or, or television or film and advertisers are, are trying to use it all in all sorts of ways right now to get us to pretend the pandemic is not still happening and buy things. Um, but there's that, there's that other side of the coin of nostalgia. I think of it as a kind of haunting. Um, nostalgia yeah. is you you go back to these moments or these places or people or times um, because you, you have not been able to move on from them for some reason because they are still compelling you, plaguing you, calling you. Um, so that sense of being haunted um, and then having unfinished business or having something that you need to tend to, um, I think is an important component. Um, and nostalgia, this, this call back to the past or this inability to move on from this haunting, I think is it's it could serve us well if we were to, to look at it that way, because if we are looking to the past in terms of um, you know, history and politics, looking to the past can prevent us our future failures, all right? We're on this slow yeah. march towards all sorts of, of decline right now in terms of society and politics where it's, it's very dark times right now. And to be able to look back to the past and learn from that, um, would really be a, a burden or not a, burden, um, a blessing for us. The same thing with um, climate change, right? If we if we look back to the past at how um, people used to tend to the land and, and respect the land and, and, and learn from it and listen to it, um, we could really learn a lot. Um, and instead we, we don't do that. We keep trying to march forward and, and we see what that gets us in terms of climate change. And again, this, this sort of march towards destruction um, so those two sides of the coin, I think, are really important. We tend to focus on the rosy, the rosy images, and I think that that's where you can get into that downward spiral of pretending things were better back then. And I always say better for who, right? Um, yeah. So that 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 you know idea of it isn't the best, but I do think that there's something to be said for a nostalgia for a past and a history that we can learn from, um, and that notion of being haunted and and trying to learn from what haunts us. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting way of putting it. Because uh, because for me, I I mean, so much of it is is trying to get back um, to memories, but it's usually strongest for me in songs or movies or or memories that that are fraught that that you know maybe i actually wasn't happy at that time and there's this strange obsession with something that i really didn't like that much at the time and now there's this this complicated relationship with this song that i i can't stop listening to it uh and it's it's making me sad but also I don't know if resolving is is the right word, but it it's it's also I think haunting is is a perfect way for it that we're we're trying like ghosts to resolve some some business that we don't quite understand. Yeah, there's also something to be said for I think sometimes when we're nostalgic, we're nostalgic for something that didn't exist in the first place, right? Because yeah. memory yeah. alters things, memory warps things. You can revisit the same memory, so and we do as memoirs, we revisit the same memory. From, you know, different decades in our life and the same memory can have a hundred different interpretations and meanings. Nostalgia is half the time you're you're longing your yearning for something that never existed in the first place, which is why it becomes so bittersweet and why yeah. it has that that sort of delightful confusion that we feel because it's it's part real um, but also not. It's it's purely a construct and we construct it to mean whatever we want it to mean in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, I could keep going on this. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to, to mention this quotation from Tobias Wolf. Uh, I was I was lucky enough to see him read um, and give a talk at um, a festival, gosh, probably 15 or 20 years ago. And somebody in the audience who clearly was unfamiliar with his work and just heard that he was from this part of Washington that this guy had known and was so excited and all he asked was in the Q&A afterward is, is, did you like growing up there? And Tobias Wolf, who had great grace and patience in the moment, uh, said, I, I, I did, but, you know, when we're remembering a place and trying to decide whether or not we liked living there, I think more often than not, we're, we're commenting on how much we liked the people we were with or the people who were around us when we were living there. And I wonder if you could talk about, because I think in Halfway From Home, that both resonates and doesn't resonate. I, I think um, there are passages where um, you probably contradict um, that Tobias Wolf sentiment more often than not. And I wonder if you could just talk about the relationship um people have to how home is defined or or how how heavily um place is defined by people if if it even is yeah um for me i don't say people have little to do with place but for me place becomes um place becomes the character or the foreground um often we 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 reserve place for landscape or backdrop, and we tend to focus on, on people. And I'm more interested in, in making place the subject or making place um, you know, the person or the, the thing that we're focused on as opposed to the people. Um, so when I move to a place or when I visit a place or when I'm, when I'm nostalgic for a place, um, I'm never thinking of the people who are there. I'm thinking of um, you know, the way the sun rises over a particular mountain range. I'm thinking of um, the fossil record and what I know um, is buried underneath. Um, you know, your feet when you're walking. I'm thinking of um, the you know the different um, sort of natural and, and geological uh, histories that are there. Um, so I'm thinking of California, and I'm referring back to the, the essay that I read at the beginning. Um, there's a particular monarch grove where all the monarchs go. Most of the monarchs in the entire world will winter in this in this one very small grove of eucalyptus trees. And if you don't know where it is, uh, you, you'll never you would never find it um, in Nebraska. Um, I know that two thirds of prairie grass roots grow underground. They're, they're unseen. Um, and so prairie grass can look only so tall, but um, if you know what's underneath, you know how far it stretches. Um, in Massachusetts, uh, in Massachusetts forests, no matter the species of tree, they're all connected by underground 
fungal networks. So trees are sharing resources and sick trees are being tended to by, by other trees who are passing along nutrients to make sure that the entire community survives. Um, so those are the things that I'm, I'm most interested in in terms of, of place. Um, certainly people and our networks and our communities influence how we, we perceive a place and, and how we get to know it. But I think that people, just as they can be wonderful and good and, 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 and create, they also can bring about great destruction and great harm to, to each other, to themselves, to communities, and definitely to um, you know, environments and, and, and sort of the land itself. And so for me, the, the interest is always, in, is always in place first and people can come and go. Um, but the place is always the thing that I'm most interested in. Yeah, yeah. One of my mentors, uh, the novelist Michael Parker, uh, he moved to Texas uh, after he retired, and he retired rather young. Um, but he, he just loved Marfa, Texas, and the landscape. And we got into a, um, a discussion uh, as he was born in, in North Carolina, which is sort of the shallow South. And you're in, you're in pretty progressive territory if you're in the cities, but less so if you're outside the cities. And Texas is, of course, Texas. And I said, what is it, what is it like there? You know, is it a, an adjustment, um, you know, politically? And he said, you know, the landscape was there before any of us, and it'll be there long after any of us. And that's what you focus on. That's exactly it. That's it. The history goes back so much further and the, the, the communities of, of an, plants and animals and, and all of that is, is so much more important than what we're fighting about on the internet at any given moment. Yeah, the discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and I do want to acknowledge that we are going to have a QA and a in, in a handful of minutes here, but I wanted to give you a chance to talk about um, the fact that you are a, a woman of letters, that you write <laughs> essays and poetry and you're even writing and publishing more and more fiction and I wonder if you could talk about how you make the decision or what the process is for determining when something is going to be an essay or a poem or a short story. Yeah um, for me I tend to write about the same thing and in, in all in all genres I'll dabble in and out so if I'm writing about if I'm writing an essay about um, Scrimshaw, for example, like there's an essay about that in the collection. Um, I'll have a poem about Scrimshaw or about scars or bruises. Um, if I'm writing about, you know, prairie grassroots or I'm researching that for an essay, I'll, I'll write a couple of poems. And I like to do that because it helps me to play with images. It helps me to play with perspective. I can, I can sort of zoom in and out on, on different ideas or topics. Um, the real reason I, I would say that I like to do that most, though, is because it gives me different, um, it allows me to exist in multiples. Um, it allows me to have um, different versions of myself on the page. Um, so I can be 10 different selves and 10 different poems. I can play mm. with persona and poem. Um, I can do that more in, in nonfiction, too, because you can write from the voice of a child, to the voice of a 20-year-old, the yeah. voice of a 30-year-old, and you're a different version. And, and you use persona in in nonfiction too. It's you, but it's also a construct on the page. Yeah. Fiction is new to me and you published my very first short story, <laughs> which I'm forever grateful. Um, I am happy to have done so. <laughs> uh, fiction always scared me, um, but during the pandemic, everybody was like making sourdough and bread and I didn't know how to do that. And there was no flour anyway. And so I just decided I was going to try to write some short stories. And I found that they are really not, they're not so different than, than a poem or an essay. Um, I think I, genre is a construct just like anything else and yeah. um, I think of the projects as being very fluid to, to move in between them if anything I probably what I what I do in one genre emboldens me to try things in different genres so if I write a very sort of brave protagonist in a piece of fiction I'm emboldened to be braver in my own nonfiction. and, and learning to write poems um, before I wrote memoir before I published my memoir being vulnerable in poems is probably what allowed me to be then vulnerable in Quite Mad or in this new collection. Um, so I, the different selves I can be in different genres uh, makes me braver and bolder and, and more willing to experiment in the other ones. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. And I, I find that they, for me, they, they inform each other. Um, I don't write poetry, but I, I was trained and, and came up writing fiction and finally wrote um, from sort of my own perspective with a blind protagonist in, in my novel, Academy Gothic, and then 
that turned out to be the gateway to actually telling my story and, and embracing um, creative nonfiction, which I've been writing. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say more, but, but you know, I have a novel um, that I finished and, and is, well, I, I digress, but the, the uh, um, relationship between fiction and nonfiction has been really interesting for me to discover um, that I, I feel like the emotional foundation, um, one brings out the best in the other. Yeah. I think there were things in fiction I wasn't tapping into until I started writing nonfiction. And um, it goes, it goes uh, both ways for sure. Mm. Um, okay, we, should we bring you back to help us uh, with the Q&A? Are the questions piling up or should we keep chatting? <laughs> I am happy to share a question we have in the Q&A. And for those of you who haven't yet entered a question, there is still time. As I said that, someone, thank you. <laughs> this, is what, this is what I'm here for. Uh, we'll begin, uh, I'll read the question uh, one at a time and let you kind of run with it. This is from Nicholas. Can you speak to the experience of processing a place when the writer is in the absence of that place? Is it a mix of mourning and celebration? Oh, I love for that. those of you who would like to see it, I'm going to copy it into the chat as well for you to read if that's helpful. I'll go ahead and riff on that a little bit. I love that question. Um, I wrote most of this book when I couldn't go back to any places, right? I mean, we were, I wrote most of this in the first couple of months of the pandemic. And so I, I couldn't, I couldn't revisit those places. And so, yeah, it was, it was a kind of mourning or a grieving for the place that I didn't have access to, um, but also a, a grieving for places that didn't exist anymore, right? Because, you know, California is on fire, <laughs> like six months out of the year. I mean, it just, it just burns every year. And then every year I, I watch, um, you know, friends have lost homes. One of my dear friends um, lost a grandmother in the Paradise Fires. Um, my parents have watched fires come very close to their home and had to leave several times. Um, you know, and, and so this the sense that the place is is changing. It is no longer what it was, and and you can't ever go back to what it was. Um, but then it definitely is also um, a kind of a kind of celebration, like a, a noticing of things, a, no, a noticing of um, you know the way that. The, the trees burst into bloom every spring, right? In Massachusetts, we have these very long, brutal winters um, and they can be very difficult to get through. And, um, you know, they last until May, but those those buds, they, they start to turn red and get ready to burst as early as February. And if you stop and notice, and, and if, if I can stop doom scrolling enough to put my phone down and to go outside and to notice that, that's really joyous to think that there's there's life happening beneath the surface as early as February, and it's and there's all this potential for bloom and burst happening for months and months before I ever even paid attention before. Um, so yeah, a mix of a mix of sort of mourning and grieving and then joy and celebration. Um, and I think that both lend each other lend themselves to each other. You you can't have you can't have celebration and you can't have that appreciation if you're not also witnessing uh, worlds change and vanish before your eyes. Seraphon, you you responded to that like you you answer that question all the time. <laughs> and it's so abstract and you put it so concisely. <laughs> yeah, good for you. We do have another question uh, that I will read and share. And then that is what we currently have in the Q&A. So I will toss it on back to y'all. If there are folks out there who would also like to get your questions in, you are welcome to. I will copy it into the chat for folks to read as well. This question is from Megan. And just as I said that there's, thank you, there's another one. <laughs> but this question for now is from Megan. What was one of the most challenging essays to write in the collection? During this writing process, what techniques did you use that you would encourage other writers to use as well? Yeah. Um, one of the most challenging essays to write in the collection is an essay. It's it's probably one of the mo more lyric pieces um, in the collection. And it's an a sort of a segmented essay uh, called Rising Tide. It appeared in the review as well. And it's was about um, learning that one of my siblings um, was really struggling with addiction. 
Um, and I learned that on the morning um, that one of my students um, died of a drug overdose. And so it was in a matter of about an hour that I learned all this information. Um, and this was also just several days before the world shut down. And so it was this really strange combination of sort of personal and professional and, and political worlds um, all sort of falling apart at the same time. Um, and I, I've written in a couple of different essays about um, my family's struggle with addiction. And I would say that's probably one of the more challenging things to write about because you want to protect, but you also want to, to share that story because it's so important and it's such a part of, of my story and my family's story. Um, and I also write um, pretty openly in this collection about uh, struggles that I had in my marriage during this time. I was really struggling with my partner. My partner and I have been together for about 15 years. Um, and, and purchasing the home was sort of a a point of, of conflict for us. I, I love to move. I love to, I love that restlessness. I love, I love chasing that around. And my partner really wanted to, to stay and, and to settle and to be somewhere. Um, and so writing about my partner and, and me and um, really a turning point in our marriage where I wasn't sure if our marriage was going to last. Um, and spoiler alert, it does, it did. Um, but um, writing about that really openly and, and um, honestly on the page was very, very challenging. Um, and I always say as a testament, anyone who is uh, a friend, family member, or, um, or partner of a memoirist and lets us do that or watches us put their lives on the page, I always say that they, they deserve sort of a round of applause. My, my partner's been wonderful about that. But yeah, a lot of just sort of personal moments that were very raw and tender. Um, and JT mentioned earlier, you usually as, as writers, we don't write about them right away. We let them simmer and um, we, we marinate them for a while before we write about those. And that essay that I was referring to um, that was about you know, my student, my sister, my marriage, um, the early days of the pandemic, I wrote in live time, in real time, which I don't think I've ever written an essay that way before. Um, that one just did. And so I think it feels a little bit rawer than some of my other work. It feels rawer emotionally, but but no less polished. It, it feels like it has the same um, skill and and perspective. Um, so, hats off. If it weren't for the the current events that we could, you know, research when they happened, uh, the the same feel um, characterizes the whole collection. So, I was I was impressed by that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking over in the chat and I see there was one other component to that question. Um, during the writing process, what techniques did you use that, other, that you would encourage other writers to use as well? Um, for me, writing is how I figure it out. Like, like I have alexithymia, which means that you can't always figure out how you feel. You've got all sorts of different feelings and you can't actually determine what a feeling is. And feelings are often conflicting. Um, so I have a, I struggle in terms of of my disability, I struggle to know how I feel in real time. So writing becomes a way to, to learn how I feel or to figure out how I feel. Um, so for me, writing is, is an exploration. I think when you're, when you're living the hard stuff, um, you know, you, you, you struggle with it. When you're, when you're writing it and you're exploring it and you're kind of you know, looking at it from different angles, then it becomes sort of a puzzle that you're putting together, for me at least. Um, so I think of it when I put it on the page, it becomes it becomes a puzzle or a map that I'm just trying to figure out. It's it's not in anymore, it's, it's out there. Um, so that's the technique that I use. But again, that could be my own brain, the way that it works. We do actually have several more questions. Uh, so I'm going to make space for those questions. And I think if we want, we can take an extra couple of minutes for them too, uh, just so no one has to worry about rushing on out of here or getting kicked off. I'll start uh, with the questions as they arrived. This is from Bruce. What is your process of writing about a place that you haven't been in a while or don't have access to travel to that place? Hmm. I'm a fan of, I, I'm a fan of loafing. <laughs> I'm a fan of, of unstructured time. The, the easiest way to take myself back to a place is to, to not be busy and on my phone is to, to sit and, and think and do nothing, which I know is a, a privilege and a luxury in this day and age, right? Nobody has any time to, to just sit and, and be alone, but um, having time where I'm doing nothing, I'm, I'm looking at nothing is the easiest way for my, my memory to take me back to places that I've been. Um, I'll also echo something that uh, JT said earlier about music. Music is a wonderful 
a wonderful way to transport yourself back in time. Uh, I, I tend to associate music very much with places and also projects. If I'm working on an essay um, or a book, I'm listening to the same um, the same album on repeat. I will do that as long as it takes. So I will listen. I mean, I wrote quite mad listening to Cher's discography, and that I, that's all I listened to while I wrote that book. Um, so listening to music, I'll sometimes look at photos, but photos are they're framed with the um, photographer's perspective, which is not often my my perspective. Um, and research, I love research. Research is woven throughout the book. So if I know that the place that I'm referring to has a certain moth that lives there, I will research moths and I will look all, you know, all into what those moths do. If I know that a particular place um, has a lot of igneous rocks, I'm, I'm looking those up. I'm buying some and like holding igneous rocks and, and playing with them. Um, again, tactile, strange sensory ways of doing things, but it works for me. This question is from Sarah. You described a bit of your writing process in terms of writing in short sections and writing a piece in multiple forms. Do you have a process when it comes to revising your work? Um, for me, the revision comes in, in two ways. Um, I'm a, I, whenever I teach, I always tell my students I'm a fan of the Tetris model, um, which is whatever form you've taken it, you, know, you can print it out and cut it up and throw it on the floor and start shuffling. Um, we tend to think linearly, we tend to think, um, I think that a lot of that's sort of taught to us in writing classes too, like linear triumphant arcs, recovery arcs, um, uh, arcs of winning and, and you know, triumph. Um, I'm more interested in starting at the end, starting in the middle. I'm interested in starting at a, at a scene that's, that's not supposed to be interesting and trying to make it interesting. Um, so I, I love playing with time. I have, I have an essay in this collection about time and why time is silly and uh, boring in any way we shouldn't use it so much. Um, so shuffling things around. And then my biggest uh, sort of recommendation for revision is paying attention to, um, to syntax and sound. Um, that changes the way that you engage with a piece. And so it's not just what's on the page. It's not just the details in the words. It's how it, how it feels <laughs> in the mouth when the reader is reading it. It's how, it's how they um, approach the sound if they're, um, they're reading it out loud or, or you know, even in their head. And so I think of sound as being something very powerful. Um, you're literally controlling what the reader does and the way that they engage with the place. You can speed them up or slow them down. Um, you can trip them up in the, in, you know, in the sentence if you want them to. You can make them take note of things through sound. So I read things aloud over and over and over again. It's probably the poet in me, um, but that's a, a big part of, of my process. I have one last question here, although it's an it's another big one, and I, I still, Sarah Fon, I, I'm so impressed at your ability to to package these down into such. I'm like, uh huh, mentally taking notes of each of these. Yes, yes, I will listen to the same album over and over again. Um, this question comes from Katie. How do you use your writing of the past to influence your present and future? You mentioned how you see similar threads between nonfiction and fiction. How do you think your reflections of your past influence your writing in other genres? Oh, I love that one. I will wait for you to put that in the chat because I want to make sure I can see the components. Okay, so I'll answer the first part first. How do you use your writing in the past to influence your present and your future? Um, I, I'm one of those writers that very rarely goes back to things um, that I've that I've written previously. There are that sort of little time capsules of who I was then. But I very much enjoy revisiting old memories. And, you know, in terms of my writing, um, I like the idea of, of recasting a memory. Right, if we're going to cast something in bronze or we're going to cast something in resin, um, when you write about it, you can recast it um, for yourself. And it doesn't mean that you manipulate it. It doesn't mean that you necessarily change it. Um, but when you're experiencing a memory um, as a child, for example, um, something that could be very painful for you or confusing for you as a child, as an adult, you have the perspective that you didn't have then. And so you can recast that memory through the writing of it. Um, so I'll give an example from, from this book. Um, my father features very heavily in this book. And my father is both a wonderful man and a very complicated, confusing man. <laughs> and so writing about the past allowed me to understand that complication a lot more than I could have. Um, when I was living it or, or when, when I was a child um, and playing with time. So writing about my childhood with my father allowed me to understand these more complicated moments that I've had with him as an adult. 
Um, so that's how I use writing to sort of revisit the past. And I love that part about how do you use it to influence your present and your future. Um, I write a lot of, um, I don't know, sad stuff, dark stuff, um, <laughs> heavy stuff. Um, and I, in my present and, and my future, I'm, I'm a very joyful person. I, I, I really strive for joy. I, I strive to find, to notice things, to go outside, to, to hold a beautiful rock, to notice like a weird bug. Um, and I think that it's, it's mining through that past and working through those sad things, those hard things that allows me to choose joy in the future or to choose um, what I'm going to focus my attention on. Um, and I'll go to the next part of the question. You mentioned how you see similar threads between nonfiction and fiction. How do you think your reflections on your past influence your writing in other genres? Um, yeah, so my sort of reflections on the past, most of my work, no matter what genre it is, um, is, is ruminating. It's always sort of going backwards. It very rarely thinks, thinks forward. So I, I write a lot about um, digging, time capsules, shadow boxes, fossils, things that are dead or preserved. Um, and those are threads that run all throughout that. Um, I, it, is a, it is a book that is new to me, but I just finished writing sort of a, a YA novel, which is my first long work of fiction. Um, and it's very much about, it, it's a haunted novel. It's about ghosts and, and, and mining, and, and mining quite literally, it's a, set in a mining town. So mining through the past and looking at ghosts and, and going back in history, it has a historical sort of um, you know, flashback that happens. So um, again, I'll always sort of looking to the, to the past and kind of trying to make sense of that. I love that you're working on a YA novel and I love the sound of it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a fun, like a fun experiment, the ultimate game of Tetris, right? Like you're just moving <laughs> all sorts of things around. Yeah. And I was going to ask um, something, a book that, that Halfway From Home reminded me of in places. Uh, and I was wondering if you were also, as I am, a, a big fan of World of Wonders by Amy Nezakuma Tatil. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Another yeah. poet slash essayist who, who uh, loves nature and research and, and blends them all pretty seamlessly. Yeah, no, I love that. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And I love the short form essays in there as well. Yeah. I'm playing with form a lot in essays. Um, I used to write really long essays and now I'm, I'm really loving short essays. And I think that that book definitely capitalizes on the, the sort of the short, the short form. I love that Kay immediately has the link for World of <laughs> Wonders. That's amazing. Do we have any other questions, Kay? We don't in the queue, but you know, my go-to at the end of an event is always to ask what you're working on and you beat me to it. So <laughs> I can't wait to hear more. And YA was a surprise. And so, uh, especially given all the questions we had uh, the past 15 minutes, it really felt kind of like we were in a masterclass. So it'll be super interesting. To, to see more, hear more about your YA novel as it comes to the shelves. Yeah, I will try, I will try, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm playing in it, which is the best part. That's always yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for your thoughtful questions. Uh, we, 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 nice big hello in, in the Q&A. So I'll, I'll close us out with this one. Uh, this is from Roseanne. JT and Seraphon. Hello from Texas. We have such a bad PR person. The major cities in Texas, Dallas, Houston, Austin, and San Antonio voted blue in the 2016 election. Yeah. That aside, I love this discussion. Have you had pushback from the people you have written about? Have they supported your work? I know you, you mentioned that earlier of just like, if you know anyone who's written a memoir, uh, so if you could answer this question, uh, and thank you to everyone who previously asked questions as well. Yeah, perfect. Um, I, I would say that, um, that a, a family members or a friend's sort of initial reaction can always change. So I've had initial positivity that then turned into um, folks not loving, you know, what I'd written. I've had some folks who initially, you know, were not excited that I was writing about them, but then were thrilled that I, that I was writing about them. 
Um, my partner, I, I always say, um, has been with me my entire sort of writing career and is wonderful and always incredibly, incredibly supportive, whether I'm writing favorably uh, about him or not. Um, and the one that I think is the most interesting um, is my mother. My mother, um, you know, did not go to college, is, is not a writer or a reader of, of nonfiction or a lot of literary works, um, but we have a lot of really good conversations about um, writing. And my favorite example that I use a lot with my students is when Quite Mad came out, there was one paragraph I was trying to fact check. And I called my mother and said, you know, did it happen this way or that way, you know, A or B? And she said, oh, it was A. And I, I fixed it. I called her a few months later and said, that's not ringing true to me. Was it A or B? And she goes, no, it was B. So I revised it over to B, B. And then I called her a third time right before it went to print and she swapped it back to A, right? So all of our memories are in, and she was doing her best. I was doing my best. So all of our memories are infallible. I think having transparent conversations um, with the people that you're, you're writing about and I always tell folks, especially like someone like my mother, I say, I can tell the same memory 10 times. I can take one memory and make it and, and make it positive or negative or confusing or sad or really happy. Same memory, different lens. Um, and so when I'm writing about anybody in my life, um, it's just that lens, right? So if they don't like it, I, I remind them that there's another essay coming. And, and if you want to be in that one, I can use a different lens for you. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for this very uh, structured conversation, but on huge topics. Um, I, I really felt like you both did such a uh, masterful job at keeping on track with what are like kind of unwieldy subjects. Uh, thank you, JT, for structuring the evening, and Sarah Fawn for your insight and your words and your time. Uh, and thank you so much for gracing us with this book. To all of you for attending this evening, please support Sarah Fawn and indie bookstores and buy Halfway Home here from Greenlight. You get a 10% off discount when you buy through us. Coupon code is in the chat. Thank you all so much. Thank you all, everyone. Bye. Thanks for sharing space. Have a great night. Good night. <laughs>